In this video, we'll talk about elementary matrices. Elementary matrices have a great name, right? They're elementary. How hard can they be? Let's take a look at where you find an elementary matrix. An elementary matrix, I put this little note up on the top here, they are n by n matrices, so you got to start with a square matrix that can be obtained from the identity matrix. Okay, so these things come from the identity matrix. And you can only do one thing to the identity matrix to keep it as an elementary matrix. And you'll notice that these are the same types of things we did last chapter when we were doing Gaussian elimination. You can interchange two rows. You can multiply a row by a non-zero constant. You can add a multiple of one row to another. So those are the three things you can do to the identity matrix to keep it as an elementary matrix. So let's take a look at a couple of possibilities. How about this matrix? 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Is this an elementary matrix? Well, sure, because it came from the identity matrix, and all I did was I switched row 2 and row 3. Right? So I'm allowed to do that. I swapped row 2 for row 3, and so sure enough, it's one of those three things that I can do. I can interchange two rows. All right, let's take a look at another matrix. Suppose I've got 1, 0, 0. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Okay. Is that an elementary matrix? No, because I must have multiplied row 3 by 0, and I interchanged two rows. So I'm 0 for 2 on that one, right? Not only did I do two things instead of one, but I multiplied by a 0 constant, which is not allowed. So that's not an elementary matrix. All right. Let's take a look at another type of matrix. Let's take a look at 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 1. Okay, is that thing an elementary matrix? Yeah, because how did I get it? I took double the first row plus the third row, put the answer in row 3. So if I take 2 times 1 is 2, plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 plus 0 is 0. So doubling the first row plus the third row Answer goes in row three. Is that okay? Yeah, that's this guy over here. Multiply a row by a non-zero constant, and it's still an elementary matrix. Now, what do these elementary matrices do? These elementary matrices are the equivalent of the row operations that we did when we did Gaussian elimination. So instead of doing the negative 2R1 plus R3, answer goes in R3, you can actually multiply the matrix by one of these elementary matrices, and it will take care of the reduction for you. The other thing is that these elementary matrices are invertible. So when you get all the way to the end, you can actually go backwards and retrace your steps. So let's run through one. This will take a couple of minutes, but it's a good one. Let's say I've got this matrix one, two, three, four. Very creative today. And I would like to take this and see if I can come up with a set of elementary matrices that I can multiply to get this back to the identity matrix. So what the first thing I want to do is I want to get rid of that 3 that's on the bottom. So I want to do negative 3 row 1 plus row 2. Answer goes in row 2. So instead of doing it to that matrix, I'm going to do it to the identity matrix. So I, if I start out with 1, 0, 0, 1, multiply the top row by negative 3, add it to row 2. So the 1, 0 stays there. Negative 3 plus 0 is negative 3. 0 plus 1 is 1. So this is an elementary matrix. I'm going to call this E sub 1, the first elementary matrix. When I multiply it, I'm going to do the first elementary matrix times A, like that. All right, so the first elementary matrix is 1, 0, negative 3, 1. The original matrix A was 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's multiply these and see what I get. 1 times 1 is 1, plus 0 is 1, okay. 1 times 2 is 2, plus 0 is 2. Down the bottom, negative 3 times 1 is 3. 1 times 3 is positive 3, so negative 3 and positive 3 is 0 out. 1 times 2 is 2. Uh, other way around. Negative 3 times 2 is negative 6, plus 4 is negative 2. All right, so that's my first one. I got 1, 2, 0, negative 2. All right, now what's the next thing I'd like to do? I'd like to take the negative 2 that's on the bottom and see if I can get rid of that. All right, so if I want to take 
the second row and divide it by negative 2, what does that look like in terms of an elementary matrix? In terms of an elementary matrix, I take 1, 0, 0, 1, divide it through by negative 2 on the bottom row. I still keep the 1 and the 0, but then this becomes 0, negative half. So that's my second elementary matrix. So my second elementary matrix times the result of elementary matrix 1 times A will give me 1, 0, 0, negative half. Right? Take that, multiply it by 1, 2, 0, negative 2, and let's see if we get what we want. On the top, I get a 1 plus 0 is 1. I get a 2 plus 0 is 2. Down the bottom, 0 times 1 is 0. Negative half times 0 is 0, so that's good. Here I get 0. And then on the bottom, negative half times negative 2 is positive 1. All right. Now what? Now I want to get rid of that 2 that's up in the top. So normally, I would think of doing this as taking negative 2 row 2 plus row 1. Answer goes in row 1. But don't do it to this matrix. Do it to the identity matrix. So 1, 0, 0, negative 2. That's what happens when I take the identity matrix, multiply the bottom row by negative 2. Now add it to row 1. So 0 plus 1 is 1. Negative 2 plus 0 is negative 2. I keep the bottom row the same in the identity matrix. It's a 0, 1. That's my third elementary matrix. All right, so I've started with the identity matrix. I perform this operation to the identity matrix, and I've gotten my third elementary matrix. So now let's take the third elementary matrix and multiply it by this matrix here, which is really E sub 2, E sub 1, A. All right, so I got 1, negative 2, 0, 1. And I'm going to multiply that by 1, 2, 0, 1. And that gives me what? 1 times 1 is 1 plus 0. OK. 1 times 2 is 2 minus 2 is 0. 0 plus 0 is 0. And then down here, we get 0 plus 1 is 1. All right. I did it. I multiplied a series of elementary matrices to get from matrix A to the identity matrix. We have a name for this that you're going to see now. It's going to go away for a while. And then at some point later in the course, it's going to come back and you're going to go, ah, I remember why we did that. We call these two matrices row equivalent. And I'm sure the text has a nice definition of row equivalent. Row equivalent basically means that I can take a matrix times a series of elementary matrix matrices and get back to the identity matrix. All right? So if the identity matrix multiplied by a bunch of elementary matrices produces a matrix, then those two matrices are row equivalent. So that matrix 1, 2, 3, 4 that I started with at the beginning is what we call row equivalent to the identity matrix. Now, it is possible to go backwards through this process. And so to start out with that matrix 1, 0, 0, 1 and multiply by a set of inverse matrices to come up with the original matrix again. So you could do that. I'm not going to work all my way through this, but if you took the inverse of the first elementary matrix times the inverse of the second times the inverse of the third, multiplied it together, you would end up with the original one, two, three, four matrix again. Right? And so we call those things row equivalent. That will lead you to an equivalent conditions theorem. And you're going to see equivalent condition theorems a couple of times throughout this chapter and then a lot more throughout the book. And what it says basically is that if one of these conditions is true, then it's true for all of them. So suppose you've got some n by n matrix A. And I'll run through it the first time. Other times I'll, I'll count on you to sort of read through the textbook and see where these things are. The first thing that's true is A is invertible. All right, nothing interesting yet. Um, the second thing you might find 
is that AX equals B has a unique solution. The inverse of a matrix, by the way, is unique. If you can take the inverse of a matrix, that's the only inverse you'll get. If you perform the operations, you won't get a different inverse at different time. So what it means is these two things are essentially the same. If A has an inverse, then I can use it to find the solution to a system. If A does not have an inverse, then I can't. Right? There's other conditions on here, too. AX equals 0, the 0 matrix has only the trivial solution. The trivial solution, by the way, is all the values equal to 0. So if I had something like 3x1 plus 4x2 equals 0, I know that if I put a 0 in for x and a zero, for x1 and a 0 in for x2, then I'm going to end up with something that works. So if I have this, that's what we call the trivial solution, right? So all the constants or all the variables equal to zero is what we call the trivial solution. So if you have the zero matrix on the other side and your coefficient matrix has an inverse, then all you got is a trivial solution. All right, the fourth thing is that A is row equivalent to the identity matrix. And think about why this works. How did we get the inverse? We got the inverse by doing a process of row reductions, in other words, elementary row operations, in order to turn matrix A into the identity matrix. And so that must mean that A is row equivalent to the identity matrix. And the fifth one is just a definition for the one above it, and that A can be written as a product of elementary matrices. So A can be written as a product of elementary matrices. And again, if one is true, they're all true. If one's false, they're all false. So if A has an inverse, then you can write it as a product of elementary matrices, meaning that it's row equivalent to the identity matrix, meaning that you can use it to find solutions to systems. Now, here's the other thing you're going to notice. In the textbook, there's a process called LU factorization. I'm not going to cover LU factorization here. It's a very nice process. It's a long process, but it's a little bit long for this. So I'm not going to go through the LU factorization and I am not going to put LU factorization on the test. So that's really the end of 2-4, elementary matrices.